My name is Maureen Bader. I'm here with the Wyoming Liberty Group. We're very lucky today to have one of our directors, Charles Curley, who also is the writer of the Liberty Index and the Key Liberty Votes, together with Amy Evans, former legislator and our newest employee, to talk to us today about how to battle those special interests who really want you to pay more in taxes. So what Amy and Charles will do is go through so, well, some of the ways you can work most effectively with your legislators. And we, we're hoping to get some back and forth. So as usual, when you want to ask a question, just let me know and I'll bring the mic over uh, so that you can speak into the mic and we can get you recorded for our um, video. Just a couple of announcements I wanted to make. Our next event in February, we're going to go back to Tuesdays. And you'll actually get a treat. It'll be me. I'll, ha I'll be able to give up my mic girl responsibilities. You'll be able to listen to me talk about the bogus budget cut that I've been writing about for the past six months or so. And also, we've got, as you probably saw on the sign outside, a sister organization called Republic Free Choice. And what we've put together is, a new, is another gas tax flyer that will hopefully give you some ideas about how to talk again to your legislators so that we can hopefully kibosh this gas tax. You can also download that flyer from the republicfreechoice.org website. If you have any questions, you can just give me a call and we can, I'll, I'll explain to you how to do that. So without further ado. Okay. Um, there we go. We're going to start off broad overview. The Wyoming legislature is a typical bicameral legislature, which means it doesn't have two humped beasts in it. It has two houses. Um, what we want to talk about tonight is, is working with your legislators in the legislature, how to be an anti-lobbyist. And uh, I don't like the term lobbyist applied to citizens, us. It's taken on a negative connotation. You know, lobbyists are people who try to control the legislators and uh, get special interest bills passed. Well, my interest has always been in liberty, everybody's liberty. I'm not out for my particular special interest. So I don't like the term lobbyist. So and I like the term anti-lobbyist. Charles, if I can, real quickly, sure. I just want to um, let you all know that we actually have three legislators in the audience. So when you want to start asking questions, we can also hit them up. We have Representative-elect Marty Halverson. Uh, we have Representative-elect Gary. And I'm not going to say your last name right until I hear it. Peeperinen. So uh, Representative-elect Peeperinen. And then we have Representative Alan Yagi, And he's an old sage, so we can ask him all kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. Feel free to jump in with questions, you know, put your hand up. And since we are taping, we're going to ask you to wait until you get the mic so we can get that down. Okay, typical bicameral, uh, two houses, you know, the, the in uh, Britain, Parliament has the House of Commons and the House of Lords. We have in the federal government the House of Representatives in the U.S. Senate. Oddly enough, in Wyoming, we also have a House of Representatives and a Senate. So, votes, okay, the process for a bill is normally, as it's introduced in one house or the other, the gotcha on that is during budget session, and I'll get into that in a minute, a non-budget bill requires a two-thirds vote, and this is becoming more and more just pro forma. Um, it goes, the house of origination can be either house, except that spending bills have to originate in the House of Representatives, like the federal. Uh, it goes, it's assigned to a committee, and we'll get into the committee system in a minute because I do want to go into that in detail. That's where you're going to do a lot of your work. Do you have a question? Yep. Do the uh, representatives and senators have to write the bills themselves, or do they have some staff available that can that know the legalese to do that for them? Yes. They Committee, so those so, uh, representatives, we don't write the bills ourselves. Uh, in general, we give language to, we have an LSO staff, uh, it's a staff of attorneys who will uh, essentially write the bill. Pardon me? 
Oh, the Legislative Service Office, which is the uh, office that essentially supports, it's the support wing of the legislature, both the House and the Senate. Now, a representative can bring an already written bill if they want to, if they have some model legislation that they've gotten from another organization, they can bring that. Generally, however, the LSO attorneys will have to change it somewhat to fit into Wyoming statutes. So, um, once a bill is introduced, it is then assigned to a committee. The committee looks it over. The committee is where a lot of surgery gets done on it. So often when you're lobbying, that's the place you want to hit. Um, comes out on the floor, first reading. Second, uh, first reading is committee yeah. of the whole. All right, we'll talk about the committee system in a minute. But the Committee of the Whole is a rather special beast. It lets everyone in the legislature have a little bit of a relaxed environment. You don't have quite as formal a set of rules. Right. So things can move very quickly. Uh, it's also a very good place to kill a bill precisely because of that informality. So the Committee of the Whole is where the, the House Majority Floor Leader will, uh, will call us into the Committee of the Whole. Committee of the Whole allows us to basically suspend rules, so it allows for unlimited debate. Um, it allows for, uh, it's, it's much more relaxed and informal, and it's where we can go and um, really dissect a bill. It's also, as Charles said, the best place to kill a bill if you haven't killed a committee, because it's where really the most uh, vigorous debate happens. On second and third reading, you're limited to two times at the mic, whereas in Committee of the Whole, there's unlimited debate. And it gets, I mean, it's, it gets raucous. It's, it's when we, you can get up and you can hammer on a bill for as long as you want to. You can ask as many leading questions. You can go after that bill however you want to. Committee of the Whole is the place where it happens. Committee of the Whole uh, bills are passed on voice vote. So there's no actual recorded vote unless <coughs> the chair, who's the chairman of the Committee of the Whole, is in doubt at that point, or unless someone calls division. At that point, a standing vote is taken. If the standing vote fails, then a roll call vote is taken. And of course, on failure of a roll call vote, the, the, the bill is essentially dead. It's, it's called, we call it it's laid back, which means the bill has died. And it's fun to do that, isn't it, Alan? It's fun to kill a bill in Committee of Whole. We don't do it nearly enough. I'm confused by terminology when I think of the committee. I think of being in a room. This right. is in the open where the legislature votes. <coughs> it's it's, <laughs> it, it's where the legislature votes, but technically speaking, they've what recessed the formal legislature and they've regathered as a committee. The Correct. Committee. They just happen to be using the large room. Okay. It's all yeah. of the House and all, right, in, in the individual chambers when we're in session, it's all of us. And we go into the first reading is Committee of the Whole. So 60 House members and 30 Senators. Anything? No, it's in the separate chambers they're doing their, we're doing our... <clears throat> Correct, yeah, different bills yeah. at different times, but yeah, we're doing Committee of the Whole work. The majority floor leader is deciding which, which the order of the bills that go into Committee Whole, so that, that is ordered for us, and then we just work through the Committee of the Whole bills every day. And I, we'll, touch, we'll kind of touch on the, a, a day in a legislator's life of how, the, how it works. But. Yes. You mentioned the uh, votes. I've posed this question before, and uh, somebody needs to refresh the reason why it, in my memory, why Wyoming doesn't have an electronic uh, vote counting uh, set up instead of, like you mentioned, uh, voice vote, I, nay, uh, that doesn't exactly say everybody voice their opinion. Uh, they could be sitting right next to each other and maybe one person. So uh, what's your uh, opinion on uh, an electronic scoreboard? 
Um, you, you know, my understanding, particularly in the Committee of the Whole work, uh, we've never had any kind of, we, we specifically keep it to a voice, voice vote unless it's close and then of course, and at any time in a voice vote, a member can call division. So if you, in, if you feel at all concerned that you want to know, or you can also call for the eyes and the nose. So any member on the House floor or on the Senate floor can get up, cite a rule and say, I'm calling for the eyes and the nose, which means we want an actual electronic vote in the Committee of the Whole. Otherwise, we do it for time. Um, that's always been the argument that leadership has made, is that if we call for, it, it takes, oh, I can't remember, the House clerk knows this, but it takes eight or nine minutes per bill to do an actual roll call vote on every single bill. And so, and there's some, uh, exactly, an actual electronic, which would be a roll call, where every member is saying uh, no, you know, I or no. Um, so, yeah. Yep. Time is generally what's been used as so the reason. All you're discussing here is a different committee system than the outside committee system. It's very similar to the standing committee, the interim committee, in terms of what the rules are and so on. It's much less formal. But the term committee of the whole is quite literally true. Every member of the body, every member of the House of Representatives is a member of committee of the whole. Does the bill go through the outside committees first or not? Through yes. the outside committees, through the standing committees first. Okay, so we, we're starting at step two of your description here of where a bill starts. Right. right. First it comes through LSO, then we haven't talked about the outside committees, and now you're talking about first reading. Right. We, we're, we're waiting for the, the committee work to, to discuss because it's the bulk of our so presentation. So step two here. Right. And we have to discuss step one. Yeah, and we will we'll go into the committee system in detail, but I wanted to do the, the body first so you get an understanding of where the committees fit into all this. No, but if it's, if it's so oh, yes. easy to, or I mean, if it's fun to kill a bill, how easy is it to kill a bill in committee? In committee of the whole? Yeah. Um, it isn't that easy. I mean, you, there's, there's gonna, it depends on the bill and, and the effort put into it. Um, but it can happen. It absolutely can happen. About which one was the easiest place you said? Um, the, the simplest place is in a committee. You have less people. Um, so the step before committee of the whole and the actual committee of, so if it goes to the transportation I mean, committee. Just how easy, is, I mean, what does it take if it's, that's the best place, the easiest the place. The majority of the members. You know, because there's a lot of stuff that makes it through there that's unconstitutional and it makes it through because it's politically correct. Uh, that's probably a different argument from what I'm making. I, I'm just making a sort of uh, a, a discussion of technically where can bills be killed. Yeah, we're, we're trying to stick with the mechanics of yeah. working in the legislature. I appreciate your point on constitutionality, but it's more than we wanted to get into this evening. Okay, uh, second reading. Now, the next day or later goes to second reading uh, like, it, it's, a, it's almost a misnomer, actually, to call it a reading, because I don't read the whole thing. It's just the, the bill number, the title, and that's it. Um, no action is required, but any action, including amendment, is fair game. So somebody can come up with an amendment, and that uh, then opens you to debate on the amendment, right. not on the bill. Of, not on the entire bill, but there is a technique for sneak. As usual, there's a technique for sneaking in uh, a lot of things. And uh, what you can do is move to, um, you can say, I forget the exact terminology. That's in third reading. In, in, third in second reading, reading, the only thing to stop action in second reading is an amendment. Okay. Otherwise, any bill that makes it through committee of the whole and goes to second reading is automatically in the pipeline to go on, unless you bring an am amendment, and then an amendment stops and we debate the amendment. And that's, okay, and it's only the amendment that's fair game, but sometimes you can do an amendment that changes the nature of the bill, and, and if the amendment's successful, you might kill the bill with that. Right. On, third reading, that. on third reading, we have what's called delete the enacting clause, and it's the only mechanism by which, unless you have a valid amendment that you want to put on a bill and, and discuss it, it's the only way you can stop the immediate vote of the bill and actually have debate. So you bring what's called delete the enacting clause amendment, and that stops the bill, um, it, when you move your amendment, you basically say, I will withdraw this at the appropriate time. If you delete the enacting clause in any bill in Wyoming, you ba basically render it 
dead. Um, the enacting clause is what gives it the power within the statute. So it's just a technical thing we do, and it's a way that we can stop and have some debate on the bill. So if you really want to kill a bill and, you're, and it's gone all the way to third reading, you bring that stop, the enacting clause. And you'll see that it happens all the time. So you'll see it happen. Okay, we've covered third reading. Um, normally, if a bill survives third reading in one house, it then goes to the other house, goes to, this, to a committee, goes through pretty much the same process. Okay, often one house will provide, an, um, will introduce an amendment and add it. The other house had, may have come up with another amendment. Now, <coughs> you go to conference committee the conference committee technically is only supposed to reconcile the two sets of amendments. Now one of the things that happens in Washington is conference committees throw in entirely new stuff. And it's terrible. They get all sorts of junk into bills that nobody's actually voted on. But I, don't, I haven't seen that in Wyoming. Yeah, we can. In Wyoming, if when it goes to conference, the, f the first time it goes to conference, it, the only thing that you're allowed to discuss is the differences between the two chambers. If that conference committee fails and they call for a second conference committee, then the entire bill is open. Generally, if there's so much disagreement, even within the first conference, if you go to a second conference, the bill's not going to survive. That's usually what happens. Okay. If it survives joint conference committee and then the two votes in the houses, it then goes to the governor for signature. Now, a couple of terms that we're going to use a little bit later. An engrossed bill, in the original house, amendments are added, language is taken out, etc. All of that stuff is reconciled and added in and they send what's called the engrossed bill to the next house. Same thing coming out of the other house, only that's the enrolled bill. So that's the process. Tracking all this, you want to use the Legislative Services Office, the LSO's website, and all of these URLs are going to be up on uh, Wyoming Liberty Group website. I'm going to do a blog entry in the next couple of days. You don't have to take notes. Um, and we'll, we've left, we put it here in case you want to write it down before you leave, just in case you don't have access to the internet. We've got the legislative web website listed right here. And a couple of things to be aware of. One, the website is typically a day, maybe two days, rarely, but it does happen three days behind what's actually going on on the floor. So uh, if you're here in Cheyenne, the other thing to be aware of is that the notices in the Capitol are authoritative. Every once in a while, there's a difference between what's on the website and what's in the Capitol. It's what's in the Capitol that's authoritative. So, so if, if you're going into the Capitol and you want to know what's coming up in, the, in the, the next day in a committee meeting, or even if you just want to know what's going on with your bill, if you walk into the front, so the south door, into the, into the Capitol, the House is on the east side, the Senate is on the west side. As you go up those two staircases, on the Senate side, they place their bulletins of all of their committee meetings. It's a, on an actual bulletin board on wheels. And it's right as you're walking into the Senate chamber. On the House side, it's on the wall over the, um, there's a little water fountain, and it says committee meeting notices. That's the place if you want to go and look. Those have to be posted by 3 p.m. Um, for the next day. So any bill that's going to be heard in a committee the next day has to be up there by 3 p.m. If it's not there and you don't see your bill, they can't, they can't be in a committee the next day. Okay. So now we get into the committee system. There are basically two kinds of committees. Standing committees and interim committees. Standing committees operate while the legislature is in session. So a bill is introduced, it's referred to, let's say, the Judiciary Committee. At a meeting of the Judiciary Committee, they'll take it up and look at it. The other kind is called an interim committee. Now, during session, the House has a Judiciary Committee the Senate has a Judiciary Committee and they operate independently. Out of session, they operate together. It's an interim committee, it's a joint committee, and the two chairmen sort of take turns chairing. 
So, question? Yes, sir. Uh, Let me bring the mic in. <coughs> yes, sir. Maybe you'll uh, come across this later on, but uh, the uh, committee s system, who appoints the committee, the leader of each house, I am guessing, appoints the uh, committee, but uh, how do they pick the uh, members to go on that committee, other than a good old boy network? <sighs> <laughs> okay, so, right, so, um, um, right after the, oh, go ahead. <coughs> and one other question. Um, for a freshman uh, legislator, what's the uh, learning curve to uh, jump into all this uh, sea of uh, laws and rules and so on and so forth? <laughs> you're, get, you're getting the abbreviated version. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, they get the bigger. The, the incoming <laughs> freshman class has already had three days of training. They will do a mock legislative session shortly. They're going to look at two bills and literally walk them through the process. So, yeah, they get, they get quite a bit of training. Nonetheless, um, you know, freshmen in any legislature are considered, they're freshmen. They're, no so, they're freshmen. <laughs> as far as the committee, the committee assignments go, so right, right after the election, um, the different, the two parties will caucus, and in the caucus, the parties will uh, elect their leadership, which would be the Speaker of the House or the President of the Senate, and then the three others. Of course, the Senate only has two others, but um, the Senate doesn't have a whip position. Um, that's their prerogative, and they don't. So, um, but the House does, so we have four. We have the Speaker of the House, the House Majority Floor Leader, the Speaker Pro Tem, and the, the Majority Whip. Uh, once those are deci decided, then essentially they meet and they assign committees. Every newly elected member and every member who's reelected is asked what committees they would like to be on. And then, you know, it's the prerogative of the leadership. Um, there's a lot of, because uh, I, I have done some of this work for a former speaker, there's a lot of figuring out schedules because certain committees meet at certain times and if you want to be on labor and you want to be on transportation but they meet at the same time you can't be so you have to work out it's it, there's a lot of puzzle piece fitting and then there is a lot of certain members want a certain committee and they're going to get it so but that's the prerogative of the leadership and the uh, the leadership appoint the chairman the committees do not elect their chairman and that chairmanship of a committee is very powerful. Yes. Okay. Um, the interim committees operate during the year. They're a little bit more leisurely than during session. They also have the advantage for those of us who don't live in Cheyenne that they do travel around the state. Uh, Corporations Committee, for example, had redistricting and they met all over the state. I was able to attend one in Warland and another one in Lander, and it was great. Uh, so committees, or interim committees, are also a possible place to kill a bill or at least see to it that it's not introduced. For example, the gasoline tax increase bill came out of the Revenue Committee in December. And, you know, it might, had it been killed there, great, that would have been pretty much the end of it. So someone could have potentially brought it as a personal bill, but committee bills have way more power and way more weight. And so um, they're harder to kill, and they're also more powerful on the floor because they're a committee bill. Okay. Um, committee meeting schedules, we've talked about uh, agendas, minutes, and draft bills. By the way, they should, for interim committees, all of these things are available on the website. The, during session, they may be available, but they not, may not be available on the website fast enough for you to use them usefully. So if you're, if you're trying to work on with the committees during session, the best place to be is in the Capitol building reading those notices. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about committee of the whole. Committee work now? I'm sorry? Committee work now? Yeah, let's talk about committee work. Um, this is where you'll find information about the committees and particularly the interim committee. 
We do have, or the LSO has guidelines for what to do. Let's touch on that a little bit. For attending a committee meeting. So committees are probably the place you're going to have the biggest uh, interaction with your legislators. And it's the place that you as a citizen can have one of the best voices is to go to a committee meeting. Uh, so you need to be following those notices and attending a committee meeting. Generally, the way uh, committees work, uh, as your bill comes up uh, for the committee to consider, the chairman, and chairmen are different, but essentially the chairman will first usually hear from any of the state agencies that might be involved in this bill. So you're gonna, they're going to take testimony from the state agencies, uh, then generally any kind of outside interest groups, and then they're going to take testimony from the general public. That's usually the order that they do it. If it's a very highly contested bill, some chairman will want to hear from all the people in favor of the bill first or, vice or against it, and then, and then the other side. So some chairmen are very specific in how they want to do it, and then some are not. Um, when you get there, you'll want to sign. There's always a clipboard. You'll want to sign in. Um, if you have any uh, documentation, and I would recommend as a citizen, if you have a lot of information that you want to give to legislators, a lot of facts and figures or constitutional issues, make up a sheet, a one-page or something that you can also have as a handout. It's, it's very useful for you to actually give a legislator some information beside, beyond just standing up and speaking your piece. And you, you want to make, the, you want to make a number of copies, one for each legislator, two to go into the record. Yeah. Uh, if press are there, you'll want more. If it's going to be a well-attended meeting, I've, I've seen in Wyoming, I've seen committee meetings where the audience was as much as 30 people. So you might want to bring extra copies for a handout and then uh, you particularly want to target press and they make press may come to you and talk to you um, be prepared your, your presentation should be short try to make it two minutes or less it should be concise it should agree with what you've got on the paper so that so that they can look at your write-up later and be prepared for questions. And questions are where your opponents will try to trip you up. As a, as a legislator, it's probably the one place that I've seen citizen, citizens get the most tripped up. And that is, you may have uh, legislators on the committee who are not in agreement with your views. And when they are, they will want to ask you some questions. And some of them are going to be tough questions. One of the biggest advice I can give you is if it's outside of your area of expertise, own up to it and say, I don't know, that's, I'm, I'm here to talk about this. Don't get led astray into something that you may not have a clear understanding of because that's how they're going to try to essentially sort of discredit you and take your argument away from you. So stay focused on what you're there to talk about. Don't get upset. Don't get angry. Uh, you know, be receptive to the questions, but stay focused. And what I do is I prepare what, what <coughs> attorneys call a briefing book. Bob, your question? I'm sorry. I'm confused about the difference between committee bills and bills introduced by individuals. How do committee bills originate and can that happen any time of the year and how does an individual influence that? So committee bills come out of the joint interim work that happens. So a committee will, um, first of all, commi committees are given directives uh, by the management committee at the end of each session. And they usually ask, they'll, they'll go before management and say, listen, there's six areas of things we want to study. So in the revenue committee, they may say, we want to look at cigarette tax. We want to look at something within the Department of Revenue. We want to look at the fuel tax. We want to, so these are the things we want to look at. They will then get approval, and they'll get funding for that. And then in the interim work, they'll start looking at that. Out of those interim committee meetings and discussions, a bill may well transpire. So the committee members may start talking about it, saying, hey, this is what we want to do, have the LSO write a bill. And then at some point, the bill will be brought forward as a draft in the interim committee work, and the committee has to vote and say, listen, do we want to take this up as a committee bill? And we all have to decide. If they, all, if they vote in favor, then it becomes a committee bill. And, and if you look at the sponsorship, it says X committee. It doesn't have an individual legislator's name on it which means you get away from, you know, 
a legislator on the committee could convince the committee to bring a bill that he doesn't want to be caught dead bringing, but he wants. Mm -hmm. So we call this virgin birth. When we first started the Wyoming Liberty Group, we had someone attend all interim committee meetings. And the story we got, I got then at that time was that the only per people who had attended previously, and unless it was an unusual case, were ad agencies and governments, uh, government people asking for things. And so it was very unusual to have citizens there and certainly no particular people who were representing a Liberty point of view. So. It's one thing to participate with a point of view in a committee. It's another very good thing to simply attend the committee meetings. Let them know you're there. Uh, get them used to your face if you can schedule it. And tell us what's happening, too. We can maybe, maybe you pick up some information that we'd want to follow through on. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. In, in my six years' experience on various committees, um, Oftentimes, you don't see citizens there. You'll see members of groups or organizations, but you're not going to see private citizens there. And I think the more you're, that private citizens are there, the better. Many years ago, I attended a budget committee hearing in Hartford, Connecticut, the Connecticut legislature, and they said, we'll be there until everybody's spoken. They went from early in the morning until early the next morning. There were three people there. I was one of them who were not bureaucrats. The state bureaucrat union had hired, I think, nine buses to bring people in. Okay? Yeah. So We don't have that ratio in no. Wyoming, but that's, that's what's possible. But you remind me of a point. Here's something else that a chairman might do, and so you need to be prepared for this. If it's a very contentious bill and there's a lot of members there for time expediency, a lot of chairmen will say something like this. Uh, you know, I want to hear from people who are against the bill. However, I don't want to hear the same thing again and again. So if your point has already been made, please don't make it again. They don't want redundancy. They want you to still stand, and so what you can basically do is just stand up and say, listen, same points that have been said, I, I'm, I agree with all of them. So you can be heard, but you're not going into two or three minutes. That's the chairman's prerogative, and you'll see chairmen that do that, so be yeah. prepared for that. And you can use that to your advantage. I once had the opportunity to say, and I want to thank Senator Scott for making the points, some of the points I wanted to make here. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> complimenting a legislator, huh? Com <laughs> not only complimenting a legislator, but complimenting a legislator whom I had disagreed with vocally on other legislation. <laughs> <laughs> Another question? Well, not so much a question, but I wanted to uh, just throw two cents in on what you're saying about uh, voice and your opinion on whatever the committee is meeting on. I attended the uh, joint session of the uh, fuel tax uh, revenue uh, committee last uh, month. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe uh, Senator Casey was chair. And anyway, as a private citizen, I didn't have what you're suggesting, a written list of a, state, uh, of a statement or whatever, when, the, uh, when Senator Casey said, any other uh, comments from anybody else in the audience? I was the only private citizen there. I said, take me, take me. So I got up there. I did my allotted five minutes. I was halfway civil, I believe. But I noticed a couple of senators wiggling around on some of my statements. But uh, I voiced my opinion. I told him I'm a private citizen on a fixed income consider all the other uh, people in this state on fixed incomes, and uh, that fell on deaf ears also. But I just wanted to uh, point that out. Yeah. I, I think it helps if you have specifics. I worked for a long time on 
uh, concealed carry reform and other Second Amendment issues. And I can tell you that saying to most legislators, this bill's unconstitutional, may be absolutely true. It's not going to work. But you've got to be, it's not going to work. You need to be able to show it to them. You need to come to their attention with arguments that they will understand. Legislators may or may not be interested in the constitutionality of your concealed carry bill, but they are interested in this, Senate, this study by John Lott where he shows that citizens carrying concealed reduce crime. That helps. So craft your argument to where, this, where the legislators are going. And, and this is standard sales technique. Anybody who's done any sell, selling knows this. The other thing I want to suggest to you is you're going to, if, if you're lucky, you're going to get questions. Some of them will be hostile. So what I've done is take a leaf from attorneys and have what they call a briefing book. It's a loose leaf notebook, photocopies of documents, so that instead of, gee, Mr. Curley, this uh, study that uh, you referred to Tell us about it, and I go mumble, mumble, well, I think John Lott proved, no. Go to my briefing book, here's John Lott's study. According to John Lott's study published in, in, during, uh, in, in July 1999, and he came to the conclusion that X percent of lives were saved, and it's all right there. You look much more professional, you've got your, your data right in front of you, and I've, I've had, uh, not in Wyoming, but in other states. I've had uh, legislators say, can I have that? Or can I have a copy of that? Here you go, Representative, have right out of the book, and I'm done with it. And those, I think those are really important, having something that legislators can take. You may not, in, you know, in the example of the Revenue Committee, you have a committee that's made up their mind, but there may have been one or two committee members that are on the fence. If you give them enough information, they may take it out onto the floor later on, and you're suddenly going to hear the arguments you were making in a committee being made out on the floor and being used successfully to try to stop a bill. So if you have good information, be sure you share it. Well, I agree with you to a certain extent, but when they ask for citizens' comments, uh, Joe Blow's citizen normally do, is not aware of this unless uh, they have worked with the state legislators or whatever. And I'm having a hard time understanding why people like us can't go in front of uh, our elected leaders and why they can't understand what we're saying verbally instead of having something written down to back up what we're saying. Like when I said I'm on a fixed income, what part of fixed income don't they understand? <laughs> well, I don't think either one of us are dissuading people from uh, participating and for doing just exactly that. There's, there's nothing wrong with attending a committee meeting, standing up and saying, I'm Joe whoever, I live at this and such street, representative so-and-so, you are my representative and I am not in favor of this and I encourage all of you to vote no. You can keep it as simple as that, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly acceptable, and we're, we're just here trying to sort of take it up a notch and, and give you some other tips about how you can be even more effective if you really want to work. But absolutely, there, don't let this scare any, if any of you are hearing this thinking, there's no way I want to go do all that, don't let that stop you from going and just standing up as a citizen and saying, I'm, in, I'm, I'm against this. What, what Amy just said is very, very powerful. And particularly mm -hmm. if you can say to a representative, I'm, you are my representative. Because now you've told him you can vote for him in or out the next election right. without being crude about it. Right, right, right. <laughs> being polite. <laughs> yeah. And, and the other thing to understand is, that, and this is particularly true during session, these guys are in information overload. Committee meetings may start at 7 in the morning and they may not finish until 10 at night. Yeah, that moves me. I'm going to move on to So that, that kind of is a good segue into this next. We kind of wanted to give you an understanding of a legislative workday. So outside of a committee meeting, the best places that you might be able to grab a legislator and talk to them. So in general, 
Legislative work days can begin as early as 7 a.m. as far as official work. They can be way earlier than that. Your legislator could be going to a breakfast meeting at 6 a.m. But more than likely, they're going to be going in the mornings to a committee meeting as early as 7 a.m. Those committee meetings can last all the way up to like 9.59, and they're rushing down to get on the floor for roll call at 10 a.m. At 10 a.m. is when both chambers gavel in, normally. There's some changes just depending on workloads at the beginning at the end, but in general, it's always 10 a.m. At 10 a.m., uh, there's a number of things they do, the Pledge of Allegiance, the prayer, the, the greeting of each other, of everyone, uh, some different stuff. And then once the workload gets started, they go from second reading to third reading. So those are usually what happens in the mornings um, because they've already been working through some Committee of the Whole. Next week, they will Committee of the Whole will happen earlier in the day, but in general, the bulk of all the legislative days um, will have second and third in the morning. They'll go for their noon break, then they'll continue on if they haven't finished second and third, and then they'll go into Committee of the Whole, and they'll work several hours of Committee of the Whole in the afternoon until they adjourn, and then they have committee meetings upon adjournment. They also have committee meetings at noon break. So as you can see, Usually, your legislators are running from one thing to the next 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 thing. This is their work day. So, in my opinion, some of the best times to contact a legislator is first of all to find out if your legislator has morning committee meetings. If they don't, then they're usually going to get to the chamber before 10 o'clock and you'll see them in there milling about. That's a great opportunity to pull them out of, out of the chamber and talk to them in the mornings um, if they don't have a committee meeting. If they have a committee meeting, you're not going to get them. During committee of the whole in the afternoon, so when they're on the floor working and it's the informal work, so they're not, they're not doing voice votes where they have to be at their desk. In the mornings when they're doing second and particularly third reading, they are required on third reading to be in their desks on the floor in their desks. So they can't, that you can't, if you send a note in to a legislator on third reading, don't be insulted if they don't come out. They simply cannot come out. They have to be in there and they have to vote. So you during the- You yourself lucky if you get a note back that says, I'm sorry, I can't come out. Right, that usually they won't even respond. They just, yep. they're at their desk and they're busy. Um, during committee of the whole in the afternoons is good to pull them out, but you need to be sensitive to what bill is up. If it's some highly contentious bill and you're sending a note in saying, come out and talk to me and they're not coming, well, it's because there's this passionate debate going on on the floor and they either want to listen or they want to participate and they, they're not going to be able to come out. And then upon adjournment is also a really good time if they don't have a committee meeting. So really understanding the legislator you want to talk to and understanding their schedule will help you to be able to talk to them at the right time. Cause I think a lot of citizens get very frustrated because they see a, a committee or they see a legislator coming out of the chamber and they go to grab them and they get kind of rebuffed and they get angry like, well, but usually it's because that committee, that legislator is going on to a committee meeting. Describe the getting the notes sent in and the credit protocol. And Right, so on both chambers, if you, uh, you, have you all been to the Capitol? I'm assuming you sort of understand the Capitol. You, there's an there's a ante room before it, the, each of the chambers, and that area, there's a, we have volunteer staff out there. There's a secretary that runs the phone. There's a sergeant at arms who handles the door. The secretary right next to her will be notes, note cards, and they're usually yellow, and you can just fill it out and say, you know, your name and, you know, who on the front you'll say representative, Yagi, and you'll say, Representative Yagi, I'd like to speak to you. Um, you know, I'll be out here. And there's several boxes you can tick. Either I want to see you in person, please come out, or I would like you to call me, and here's my number, or however you want to. Generally, if you want them to come out, you hand that to the secretary. She'll hand it to the sergeant of arms. He will take it inside the door. And then, depending on what's happening on the floor, certain times when we're in third, when we're in third reading, no, no one come, can come onto the floor. So our little pages that run back and forth, they can't even come out. So no notes are going to get distributed until we're out of certain motions, certain areas of work, and then it'll get to put onto a desk, the legislator will read it, and hopefully we'll come out and talk to you. That's how it works. Representative Yagi. I was used to say, I think what they're saying right here is right, um, but the best way that I found to talk to me is on email. Mm -hmm. um, I just appreciate emails and the second red thing she has right there is be brief. Um, yes. <laughs> say what you have to say in bullet points and we go to a lot of meetings and we get 
10, 12 pages of stuff, and I keep telling them, give me one page with bullet points on. So the same with you guys, when you want to talk to a legislator, be brief, have your points made, so it just takes less time, and then I can remember what you're talking about, and you know, I can file it in my, however we file things, write it down on the bill, whatever. But emails are, I think, probably the most efficient way to get to a legislator. And I will say, this schedule right here is for the legislators that are really involved in doing things. There are some legislators that are here for a vacation. And the busy ones are just tough to find. And so be considerate of that and be brief. And emails are also good. Yeah, those are all good points. So um, rules of thumb, and I probably don't even need to say these, you understand them, be polite. Uh, these are passionate issues and you all are passionate people and that's great, but just every human being, be polite. It's what you need to do. Be brief, as Representative Yagi said. Again, if you have a handout or some piece of information, a website, something on a web page that you saw that you want to um, bring it, um, make sure that you have your contact information available. So if you're going to talk to them face to face, either have a business card or something. If you want them to contact you later on, have a way to get it. And if you can't be brief and you have a, something you really want to talk to Representative Yagi about, as he said, email him. And we've, we've put the emails up here. It's a simple formula. It's the first name of the legislator, a dot, the last name, at wyoledge.gov. You can contact any legislator that way. So you just need to know their first name and their last name. Send an email to them and say, listen, can I have a cup of coffee with you? Can I meet you for lunch sometime? I have, the, you know, I have a bunch of information on the fuel tax that I want to sit down and talk to you and see if you can get them. And, and when you send an email, think of the subject line as a way to put what you want to say very briefly. Uh, yeah, oppose HB 47. If a legislator is really busy, like I remember a couple of years ago, Mary Throne complaining that her Crackberry was about to crash because it was so overloaded. These guys get swamped with emails. A couple of hundred, 300, 500 a day. We can, it depends on the subject matter. Yeah. If it's a gun bill. <laughs> if it's a gun bill, you'll get a lot of emails. It's gonna be yeah. a lot, yeah. And um, so, very concise subject line. And if it's just, you know, oppose HB 47, if, the leg if that's all the legislator sees, you've gotten 90% of what you want across. Yeah. And um, then in the body of the email, a very short argument as, as to why uh, the legislator should oppose or support that. And, and make sure when you send email that you put your name and where you're from. Because we do get a lot of emails from people who do not live in Wyoming, and I don't care about them. So make sure you put that you live in Wyoming and where. One of the things I hear from legislators is they, they really don't hear from constituents between the sessions. So when it's out of session, uh, they, they, they appreciate somebody talking to them, having them for coffee, having them for lunch. If you have uh, an issue that you're going to care about, you have to plan long term anyway. Mm -hmm. So maybe you've been doing some preparation. Maybe the legislator has some ideas on it that they could give to you. Mm -hmm. And you can also express appreciation to your legislator because they, they do put a lot of work into it. So that it's one thing to get them during the session, but after the session or before the session also. Yeah, and you know, if you, re and if you really want to take the time and, and really be involved in the political process, then I would definitely say take the time to make that relationship with legislators, um, you know, either by email or seeing them once or twice on the off time of year and build that relationship. And so that, yeah, and oftentimes we hear from people in, you know, in, in the heat of the battle of something very briefly, and then we never hear from them again. And I think it's, it's good if you want to establish those long-term relationships to take the time to, to build that up. And it, it's standard human relations relationship. And the other thing is emphasize something Susan said. Reward them when they do something right. Punish them when they do something wrong. It works with cats. It works with dogs. It works with horses. Well, but also appreciate those people. Well, yeah. I'm, just, I'm, I'm just saying it. it, it yeah. Well, uh, you know, one of my frustrations is, is avoid generalities because, and I and I I understand the heart, and I think Representative Yagi, we understand the heart of where these generalities come from, because we know that people are frustrated. But avoid 
things like all politicians are crooked, they're all bad, they're all corrupt, they all don't listen, they're all horrible, because there are many, many, many good, there are many good people in your legislature. There are many really good people. And it, it doesn't help your, your cause or you to try to make a relationship when you use these huge generalities. And even if it's true, they don't want to hear it. <laughs> no one wants to hear that. I, you surprise me about talking to them when they're not in session. I just think it's all over. Like they are involved all year round, even if they're not in session. That's correct. Do they Absolutely. show up at the, the Capitol all year round? Or they're in their local, like, Casper office and Cheyenne office? Or They're at home. Uh, your state legislators, none of, none of us, none of them now, since I'm going out, we don't have, they don't have offices. Um, when you go to the contact information on the LegisWeb, the beautiful thing about Wyoming is more than likely you're going to call them at their house, and you're going to talk to their wife or husband, and you're going to, because that's how informal it is. They, don't, they have no staff. We don't have, right, no staff. No staff. So where do you call them? Um, when you go onto the legislative website and go to the legislative They're information, the phone number oftentimes is a home phone number. Okay. Sometimes it may be their office if they have a, if they're a business owner okay. or they work or their cell phone, but you may well be calling their house. So what do they do when it's not in session? What uh, we're, whatever we're, their day job is. <laughs> yeah, we're a citizen legislature, so... So how would, how would, they're not doing anything actively oh, except well, talking well, to you? Representative Yagi is a retired school teacher. So uh, he's retired. I, I don't know what representative elect, but most of them have a job or had a job. And but I mean, as yeah. far as you know, being a representative, the only thing they're actively doing is me calling them and me saying I want to talk to them. They're not really working on any. Committee. They're doing so. I, I this last two years, I've served on appropriations, um, and almost on a weekly basis, I'm getting a packet or some report or something, I'm reading through a whole bunch of stuff, and then I'm going to interim committee meetings. So during the off season, your legislators are working. They're not working full time every day, eight hours a day, but they're certainly reading reports, getting emails, and then dealing with constituent issues when you hear from a constituent. And do you actually have meetings? Like you actually can, that's, is that the out of session meeting? Are? Interim meetings, that's but correct. They're not every day. They're just like called for a special. Right. Whatever. And you can go onto the legislative website. They have a calendar, and every month you can see the list, and there's usually, oh, I don't know, four or five uh, meetings a month. And as Charles said, the nice thing is they're all over the state. So for the people that don't live here in Cheyenne, there, there's going to be meetings in Casper and all over, Thermopolis, Rock Springs. But they're just the committee meetings, they aren't everything. Right. They're just the committee meetings and catch your legislator at home in between. And Amy's right, the, le the legislators have their day jobs. Um, Kendall Croker runs a sporting goods store or something like that. Yeah, yeah motorsport, he sells. Mo motorsport stuff. Four wheelers um, and. Nathan Winters is a preacher, so don't call him Sunday because he's <laughs> at services, you know. Uh, and this information is up there on the website, uh, what they do for a living. Some are ranchers, some are, I mean, yeah. yeah our, our outgoing Senate president, John Hines, is a sheep rancher. Go ahead. Uh, I've gone over, talked to my state uh, senator. Prior to that, he uh, was a state representative before he switched across the aisle. But anyway, um, he says many times he's had to uh, attend uh, meetings sponsored by uh, the lobbyist groups. Uh, what sort of influence other than free dinner and booze and so on and so forth? Uh, because he, he admits this, and uh, what sort of influence other than vote for this or whatever um, is that supposed to do? You want me to tackle this? I can start. Um, well, I don't think the word had to is proper. No legislator has to attend any special function put on by a lobbyist group. They choose to go or they choose well, not to right. go. Okay. Yeah, so don't, I mean, your, lobby, your, your legislators are under no obligation to attend any of those things, but most of them go. Um, 
my experience, I'll be very frank, uh, we'll have a frank conversation. My experience is a lot of the lobbyists in this state um, serve as an information conduit. So you can get a lot of information from a lobbyist. Um, if there's some particularly uh, complicated subject matter, perhaps on energy, we have a lot of energy lobbyists, you can ask them. A good lobbyist is the lobbyist who you can look at and say, now tell me what the other side is going to tell me, and they'll be honest with you and tell you that. Um, and that's something you can you sort of can look for um, as far as influence um, What I discovered is that If you go into if you're elected and go into the House or the Senate and you know who you are uh, Lobbyists really aren't going to affect you if you don't then you and these are the people you'll notice get pulled out a lot into the chamber the freshmen because they're unknown entity are going to get pulled out a lot regardless but very quickly, lobbies, lobbyists are going to figure out, you know, it's just not worth my time pulling out Representative Halverson because I know how she's, I know ideologically this is who she is and she's just not going to go my way, so I'm not going to waste my time. Um, but they have to learn that, so they're going to pull her out at first for a while. And, and that's just the nature of the beast. That's how it works. Yeah, on the federal level, look at Ron Paul. It's, it's gotten to the point now where the lobbyists don't even bother going in his office, literally. Um, for Washington, that's an extreme example. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we've got people in the legislature here of comparable integrity. Yeah. And a few who aren't. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing else to say. <laughs> uh, okay, committee information. Um, one of the things you want to notice is when they talk about committees, committees have numbers or designations. And the reason those become important is because when you look at the digest, it refers to assigned to committee number four. You're, for some reason, their software isn't smart enough to tell you that's the education committee. Um, but that's useful information to know when you start looking at the digest. Um, daily meetings during session are available here. Listen for announcements of committee meetings on the, you, oh, you can get the audio from the LSO website and between roughly 11.45 and noon. But they live stream and we don't want to, uh, they live stream all day. So you can actually listen to your legislature at work every day, all day long. So you can get onto the LSO website at 10 in the morning when they gavel in and you can listen to the whole day. This is, this is for the bodies, but not the committees. Not the committees. The committees are not. The only committee that live streams is the Appropriations Committee. Okay, and the Committee of the Whole, obviously. Right, and Committee of the Whole. Are we about out of time? Time to wrap it up, Charles. Okay, um, bill information at this URL, and again, I'm going to put all these up on the website. Um, contacting legislatures, we've talked about that a little bit. Their contact information is available. Uh, there's an unofficial Facebook page. I think Sue Wallace is running there. Yeah. And that's great. Oh, we talked about emailing. Some legislators have an official email address, which they ignore, and an unofficial email address. So just be aware that, that that's a constituent avoidance tactic. The one other option is the telephone hotline, and we've listed it here. So if you don't want to go in person or you want to, you can call in and do a telephone hotline. We also had the, they also have an online hotline. It only allows for 140 characters. So if you have a lot you want to type and say, this may not be the best option, you may want to email. But those two th ways are uh, also ways that you can contact a legislator. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much, Amy and Charles. Um, we had a good discussion. Thank you for also you who have attended and uh, it's open for questions thank you